Good evening and warm welcome everyone to the League of Women Voters holiday panel fall meeting um, for a meeting with the newly elected um, board members of the Albany Unified School District, um, Veronica Davidson, uh, the two members of the Berkeley Unified School District Board, Anna Vesodev and Laura Babbitt. So nice to have you here and congratulations to for all three of you. Um, so just to let you know, this is being recorded. Uh, so our uh, panel, the title of our panel tonight, as you know, is Pursuing Excellence Through Uncharted Territory. So this is a upbeat in a way in spite of the difficult times we're passing through, not only the pandemic, which really is a huge responsibility for educators and parents, but also um, the election, uh, which hopefully is more or less behind us. <laughs> At any rate, um, we're so happy that you're able to join us tonight and give us your thoughts about the way ahead through this uncharted territory. So we are going to have first um, statements from each of you sort of introducing yourselves. And following that, we'll have questions from league members and also from the audience. Anyone who wants to submit a question can do so through the chat. And hopefully we'll have time at the end to take as many questions as possible. So with that, I think we can, oh, and oh, forgot. At the very end, we'll have a socializing. We really miss, normally we have a party, an open house around this time and you know we really felt the need for getting together and so there will be breakout rooms at the end and everyone not just league members but everyone is invited to stay and mingle so hope you do and so now we will start um, alphabetical order so uh, we'll start with Laura maybe Laura can give us a few minutes of her introduction. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for hosting this panel on this important topic. I am Laura Babbitt, newly elected school board director for the Berkeley Unified School District, and I am very honored to serve. Uh, Berkeley has uh, coined the phrase emerging stronger. Uh, coupled with Berkeley Public School Fund. So our whole goal is to really come out of this pandemic stronger than we left. And so I'm looking forward to this engaging conversation, to, uh, gleaning from everyone's ideas so that we as school board directors can help make that happen for our students. So thank you again for having me and I look forward to this conversation. Well, so glad you could come. So the next person, Veronica Davidson. Albany Unified School District Board. Thank you. I'm Veronica Davidson. I'm newly elected in Albany and I'll be sworn in next Tuesday. I'm really looking forward to getting in and joining the meetings beyond just the trainings. Um, I am a parent of two children in our district and a teacher in the district last year and previously I've been an educator for about 15 years and I'm really, really excited to come in and support a connection between our parents and our teachers. I feel like in Albany, we have some room to grow in creating a, an even stronger cohesive community. Um, and so I'm really excited about doing that. And I think coming out of the distance learning time in the pandemic, we're going to need to 
target that even a little bit stronger than we would in normal times. So I'm excited to hear what people have to say to carry us smoothly through the rest of this and into our transition. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Anna Fasuto, next from Berkeley Unified School District Board. Hi, well, thank you so much to the league for hosting this conversation and Ruby for facilitating today. My name is Anna Vasudev, newly elected school board member in Berkeley, sworn in today. So today is my official first day on the job. Very excited. Um, and again, you know, as the other school board members have said, this is a very challenging time to serve, um, but we can't you know, we can't stop forgetting about all the other issues that happen, you know, the challenges that we have during the regular school year too. So I'm looking forward to serving. I know that reopening schools and, you know, navigating through the pandemic is like the number one issue, but you know, our closing our opportunity gaps is a challenge that we've had whether, you know, pandemic or not. And so I'm uh, really looking forward to working hard this year more than ever and keeping equity at the forefront of our um, issues here in Berkeley. Well, that's great. It's wonderful to have, you know, you energetic, <laughs> uh, competent people here on the school boards. Um, I think I forgot in my excitement to mention that um, I'm Ruby McDonald, president of the league, formality. Um, but let's go now to our first question, um, sort of a laid back. Uh, I'd like to know uh, what your vision is of a best or optimally arranged day in school using uh, distance or virtual learning combined with in-person learning. So what we can do is just go, uh, we can do the same thing um, alphabetically, if, if that's okay. So Laura, would you like to start us off? Sure. So as I understand the question, it is what would a, a hybrid learning day look like? Mm -hmm. um, would some remote and some in person in the same day? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, Berkeley has actually uh, cast its model of what that would look like. And I would prefer if the um, in-person learning was longer uh, in the mornings and started in the mornings. And then uh, the remote learning sessions were kind of in the afternoon. I think the way we have it designed right now, which I'm not sure how much I'll be able to impact being that today is also my first day, but um, the way ours is designed now is uh, midday, there's kind of a shift so that remote learning can stay intact in the mornings. And then those who want to go into in-person learning in the afternoons can uh, shuttle their kids in for the hour and a half or so and then pick them back up. My only issue with that, of course, is for parents who don't have the luxury of being able to get their children to school in that kind of midday shift. And so I think if we were to rethink that so that parents can drop their kids off in the morning, um, it's kind of easier to do a run lunchtime or to get someone else or to have them go right into the after school program so that there's just more consistency for our working parents and parents who don't work close to home or uh, remotely at home at all. So, but I definitely think the more we can increase our um, in-person instruction timely, uh, safely is definitely the way to go because we know studies show that's where our kids grow the most from the in-person learning. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it seems that time of day will be really important, um, what activities you have. So Veronica, how would you like, how, what would your day look like? I'm gonna be very honest. I actually am not a strong supporter of the hybrid model. And I know that that's not what everyone is looking to hear. Um, I think that it, I think that it entails so many additional challenges and it's a focus for maybe a shorter amount of time. I, I was hoping that we would focus more on getting our um, learners with the highest need in for their support in our district. From the surveys, we've had pretty even split on parents who would continue with distance learning for the remainder of this year and parents who would send their students back. Um, and so using that data, maybe giving some students the in-person and some students continuing the distance learning so that those who need it uh, more, more, I don't know, 
thoroughly more deeply um, could get that in-person support for a longer amount of time. And we could keep things, in my opinion, safer in a classroom with less inputs. If we do have to continue down the path of the hybrid learning, um, I would agree with Laura that we need to shift it to the morning. Albany has gone a very similar model to putting our in-person in the afternoon. Um, I think that that's mainly to focus in on the social emotional for the students. And I think that's great. I would prefer to maybe see that we do some academic instruction in the morning hours and then in the afternoon hours, um, we do some outdoor activities so that the parents can get a little bit longer of a time and the students get other inputs done safely uh, that allow them to stay in one unified cohort. I, again, I'm concerned if we have such a short amount of time and parents need that coverage, that's what they're really uh, mm -hmm. needing if they're essential workers right now or even working from home with a lot of kids in a small house or a house that's just not set up for this. Um, they need more hours of, of coverage and We've been asking the question a lot, is schools role education? Is it childcare? That is such a hard question to ask. And I think we have to prioritize the learning needs right now, but we can, we can think about some ways even still to get creative. I just keep getting concerned that the clock is ticking and we're not, we're not moving on a clear path for any district yet. And I, I think that's very understandable in a pandemic that a lot of changes have been thrown in. Um, but I'm just not, I'm not convinced that our plan either really puts the student learning needs and, and gives a full picture of what our big idea, our huge goal is of supporting student learning and what we're, they're gonna get out of this. Mm -hmm. So that's my, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very complicated. Um, Anna, it's your turn. What yeah, would well, your day look like? <laughs> no, I think uh, both Veronica and Laura brought up a really good point. I think, you know, we need to prioritize, you know, teaching as, as much as we can high quality instruction. And I think making sure that we are planning proactively for learning loss, because I think, you know, that's mm -hmm. definitely going to be present next academic school year. So mm -hmm. for me, you know, one of the things that keeps me up at night is how are we planning for learning loss? How are we really, mm -hmm. um, you know, piloting target interventions? for our African-American learners, Latinx students, students with disabilities, and students that continue to fall you know, further behind during the regular academic school year. And what are we doing now, right? What do those target interventions look like? I would say that for me, you know, I, I work professionally very closely with SFUSD and I've seen a lot of challenges yeah. with this like asynchronous and you know, synchronous instruction. Mm -hmm. For me, making sure that it's synchronous. I don't think when you have like too many, I think some districts are combining things a lot, right? And I, I don't think, um, when you you know split it up so much, you're trying to accommodate for everyone, right? And then you split it up so much, it becomes very hard for students that have to go to to all full day childcare centers, right? Um, it becomes very hard for the staff there to really support them if students are all you know on completely different schedules. So I do appreciate the the fact that we have a synchronous model that all the students around the same time are getting that high quality instruction, right? I think that that's something that. When we when we plan for you know whatever model in the spring, that mm -hmm. to make sure that the high quality learning instruction is around the same time of the day, I think is really important because people are making different childcare choices for their students, mm -hmm. and I think that consistency is key. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of aspects that I like to ask, but one thing I you mentioned learning loss, and right now since it's sort of early days. Um, is there data that can, does indicate um, what you can do to try to prevent or prevent learning loss or maximize uh, long-term achievement so that what you're doing now, you know, will continue, will uh, have effect? It seems as though it's not really clear at this point what you can do to ensure long-term achievement. So I would say the um, that our teachers are doing a great job with the tools that they have at this moment. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen my teacher, I have a fifth grader, I've seen her doing the assessments, really reaching out, really staying connected. 
Uh, we also have after school staff who um, can do some specialized help and homework help with our students. Um, we, we're fortunate that we have partners with, like I said, the Berkeley Home Schools Fund, as well as Lawrence Hall of Science and just volunteers mm -hmm. who are really trying to, um, to work directly with more students. Um, so I think in that sense, that is the only way we can mitigate, you know, the, mm -hmm. the worst situation that we are actually in as far as preferred education, right? No one would prefer, most people who don't prefer online education. So uh, going forward, however, I think plans that I've had already to address the um, opportunity gap or the achievement gap um, as far as seven period days, specifically at middle school will be important. Uh, making sure that our extended day learning programs are actually maximizing that time for enrichment as well as educational support and really um, shifting our mindset to high expectations, right? Um, what is accelerated learning versus just uh, focusing on intervention? What is the mindset of, uh, of high self-esteem and really building our students up so that they uh, can feel the success and that they're more celebrated, right? And how are we really going to monitor these pullouts and push-ins and um, all of the different um, intervention models that we currently have, how can we change those towards mastery levels, right? So that we're concentrating on what we need them to master and how are we still teaching them grade level standards, but scaffolding in the things that they need, some of the things that they missed in prior grades. Um, so there's much work to be done even before the pandemic. And so I am grateful that, um, you know, how you have to look for the bright side. So advocating for funds for this learning loss uh, should help us to be able to not only address um, learning loss because of COVID, but a learning loss that we've always needed to address because of our longstanding achievement gap. I think, uh, yeah, a lot of what Laura said, I, I agree with too. And I'd say, you know, thinking about what are we doing for the summer, right? Like, what does summer look like? And what kind of programs can we have in place for the summer to address learning loss, particularly for children with disabilities, too? That's a huge population that we know that, you know, the regulations have changed during the time of the pandemic, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that somehow magically we address all the needs of those kids, right? Like, they have IEPs that require certain services that you can't do virtually, right? And so how are we going to make up for that during the summer? I think that's another thing that really worries me too. And I know that's been a, a, not only a big issue for Berkeley, for every district, right? I think um, for children with disabilities, we, ha we have to commit ourselves to doing something for the summer to address you know, the significant learning loss that will be there. Oh, oh now <laughs> so it's Veronica's turn. You know, we forget that there's really a huge arsenal of techniques that educators have at their disposal. But Veronica, what do you think about uh, learning loss and how to prevent that? Well, I think that what we're, we're just seeing is um, the, the learning loss and the differences that were there before we went into the pandemic are now in everybody's home and more clear to parents and they're growing larger for those students uh, on either end. And I, I have a couple of thoughts. One that I would love to see more is more trainings and support for parents because they are the teachers in their homes. Um, someone posted, well, Cheryl Thies, who's from DREDF, um, posted a great thing last week about how anxiety often masks itself as anger. And I think giving parents the tools to be the educator in their home, as well as a better, stronger parent, maybe not a better parent, but a, but a more um, understanding parent. This is hard for me as someone who studied education for many years, sometimes with my own children and the reminders are so helpful. And we're asking parents right now to do three jobs. They're being the parent, they're being the teacher and they're working. So giving them more support right now can really help them to keep their kids on a better track. And they're the ones who are often in, in the place with the child. Um, also for the children who don't have that, making sure we have places for them to go to be safely supervised and get some support, whether that's online or in person. Um, one thing that Albany has put in at some levels is student to student tutoring. Uh, that's been really wonderful to kind of see them develop that program. 
and, and make it available so it's free to families that need it. And it gives other students that sort of empowerment that they have this knowledge and they can share it. And it really gives um, children and students who maybe sometimes are feeling less engaged in class that extra push to pay attention and think about it because they might need to reteach it to someone. So that's really something I stand behind. Um, this was said a little bit before, but continue the curriculum at grade level um, as much as possible in the online formats, but making sure that we're putting in those building blocks for learning loss that happened previously. And we can do that by having the children use uh, apps, online games, and then having small group times where maybe a specialist does come in still and support or they can be a little bit more leveled so that we can offer better supports. I think those things can help us as we move in. Um, I think getting, again, some in-person back as it's safe, this seems to be just a hugely overwhelming challenge. And I really need, I'm really excited to hear the back workings of our district's process on that some more in the coming weeks. Um, but I, I'm really strongly gonna going to push for something outside as it seems safest to get those students back and supported a little bit more. I think you're muted, Ruby. Computers sometimes unreliable. <laughs> so there are these choices and that's great. But on the other hand, uh, there may be the problem of um, how to um, convey to people that there is uh, a path, a single path that you would like them uh, to follow um, so that, for instance, students are absent or, um, you know, they, people aren't following along, um, that could prove a problem too. In other words, you have so many choices and yet um, you don't want to lose sight of the idea that um, there are, there is a direction that everyone's supposed to be going in order to accomplish. Um, so if I can put that out there, um, what can be done, say, to uh, discourage or dampen down uh, absenteeism or maybe not quite following along uh, with the program that's been designed by you professionals? Anybody want to start with that? A toughie. <laughs> Go ahead, Veronica. I'll jump in. OK. <laughs> um, I think what I've seen work really well on this is the teachers still making personal connections with their students, even though it's online, that's still possible. And taking a little time, last year in the spring, I did some one ones with students who are really struggling so really trying to offer that little bit of time to make a personal connection with the teacher can really get students to feel motivated to be in that class because they know the teacher's giving them that attention uh the other ideas that i had was during the class times just to make sure that your students have a chance to feel like they're a valuable member my son's first grade teacher today she played a joke that he'd recorded and uploaded onto Seesaw and he was just over the moon because the whole class got to see him telling a joke and that just made his whole day. So it's very little things that still get them to feel connected and they look forward to because, oh, I have to log back in because it might be my joke of the day. So those things are, are still very important to have at the middle school and high school level. Uh, I think a lot of students are taking this on independently and logging in as they need to. So really there it's about having them work collaboratively with their peers, if that's possible in breakout rooms. I still like those to be somewhat supervised because there's a little concern to me in those. Um, and giving them projects that they can work on and then share back and maybe it's your day to present, things like that so that they still feel like there's a back and forth even though it's on a screen and that it continues to be a challenge. 
Yeah, I'd say, you know, when I think about truancy and absenteeism, for mm -hmm. me, what where I see districts kind of struggle is on culturally responsive outreach, right? And this came mm -hmm. up at our previous board meeting this mm -hmm. mean, like uh, this week. Like, what does culturally responsive mean, right? And I think that it's it's a nice buzzword, but without like authentic engagement with community groups that are at the forefront of culturally responsive outreach, I think districts kind of fall at like fail at this. And so I um, had the pleasure of attending this session, this like training session with uh, the California Latino School Board Association, and just heard from like different districts what they were doing to reach out to students of color, right, like families of color that. Where, it, where there was a lot of absenteeism. And they're like, well, you know, we started just calling people. It can be a phone call, it can be a text. Mm. Um, and there's so much technology out there to make these things easy, right? There's also some messaging apps that teachers are using. They're like, it doesn't have to be this huge time consuming thing. It, mm. That just like very direct personal outreach. And I think, you know, that was one of the first points of feedback that came out of, we had these town halls in Berkeley for different affinity groups. And I mm. think, you know, it definitely came out, um, for our for a lot of for a lot of our families that said we just want to sit down with our teacher and explain our situation right like why certain classes will be hard for us like what my work schedule is and I think parents wanted that one-on-one -on -one connection so we had these family meetings at the beginning mm -hmm. of the school year this fall which were great but I think you know for for educators obviously like they're so busy it's not like you know they're putting together the curriculum they're teaching um, but even if it's just text, like, hey, I know you can't make it to this. Is there anything that I can do to make this easier for you? Um, how's your work schedule? How's your how's your little guy doing? But I think connecting with the parents and the students, right? So it's not it's not punitive. You're really trying mm -hmm. to come and understand each mm -hmm. family's unique perspective um, and really value, you know, that they're they're what they're facing, right? Like acknowledge and acknowledge on both sides. And I think, you know, I've definitely as as a parent wearing my current hat have built that relationship with with my children's educators where I'm really honest about you know date what which days are going to be a challenge right but mm -hmm. I think um you know for parents that feel like they don't have a voice like making sure that, mm -hmm. that there's some outreach mm -hmm. from the school saying like hey we know it's hard and not in a punitive way like what can we do um to make this better for you like what would work and I think you know, flexibility and grading there's just so much that we can do um to to tackle this issue mm -hmm. yeah that sounds great um, it reminds me of the toolbox uh, uh, in Berkeley Unified at one point, right? Maybe it still exists. Um, it does. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Laura. So I would agree with uh, both Veronica and Anna that um, we do need to keep it engaging through relationships and uh, through content. Um, and so I think that is you know, the driving force even for us as adults as to what we want to choose to attend or not to attend. And so I think that's why our teachers are saying, oh, teaching is so hard now because they're, they're really like becoming these entertainers and performers and really trying to keep it engaging and finding good video clips to show to support, you know, whatever uh, theme that they are instructing on. Um, so it's a lot of work and it takes our teachers a lot of planning time just to get them engaged. Um, it definitely takes those texts and those communications. And our teachers are so good that they can tell when the kid is on the computer, but definitely on another tab, like on another screen, uh -huh. <laughs> like watching YouTube or, you know, <laughs> using a calculator and not really using the, you know, the, the instruments that they've given them. Uh, for example, with a math problem, they have to show it, like show your work, show everybody what you did. Uh, so those kinds of things keep them engaged so that they don't feel like, you know, a college student in a lecture hall, you know, for 45 minutes, and then I got to go off and do my homework. Um, so it is definitely a challenge to keep kids engaged. And then as parents, you know, we just have to do our part and just say, you know, Christmas is coming or Hanukkah is coming or Kwanzaa, whatever it is, you know, those gifts are still tied up to this schoolwork and, you know, <laughs> putting our own internal motivations to uh, have our children do just like we, you know, we did in the in real school, like when we were in person learning all of the time. So it's definitely a challenge for everyone. And I feel so bad for our students because, you know, for them, the best part of school for a lot of them, should I say, was the social interaction. Mm. And so now it's like most of the social interaction is gone and they're just stuck with what 
most people felt was the worst part of school was just the reading, the writing, the math, you know. Um, so now to really hone in on making that engaging is definitely content based and is definitely in structure based and relationship based. My child's summer school, um, it was an extracurricular summer school from nine to 12. It was online, but the content was so um, engaging to her <laughs> that it's amazing the difference this, you know, these two little 45 minutes are versus mm -hmm. that nine to 12 session where she was able to sit and thoroughly be engaged. But the content was all around um, African American history as well. And when we're talking about math and science, mm -hmm. how does that relate to, you know, these math and sciences that, you know, helped send uh, America to the moon, right? So it, it definitely makes a difference. And, um, that is the way that we need to go regardless of in-person learning we need culturally responsive curriculum culturally competent teachers and we need that parent relationship so that everybody is working together with the parent and the teacher and the student to drive those outcomes that we're reaching for mm -hmm. yeah it hearing you say that it strikes me that there are some things about virtual learning distance learning um, that are particularly, well, lacking from in-person actually, and could be a, you know, a boost that um, people could really hone in on to make that experience um, really stand out and be effective. I mean, you're mentioning uh, some of these technological feats that you can show on the screen, um, but maybe there are others. I Anybody have some thoughts about that? What about distance learning is really, you know, special attribute that you don't get with in-person learning that could, you know, tip the balance so that kids really would like to um, take advantage of that. Well, I think the use of technology mm -hmm. has always um, been a difference in different classrooms, even before in-person learning um, in different schools, right? Because my, um, my daughter's school, most of the teachers were already Google Classroom certified. So they were already, you know, using technology in the classroom. They were already using, you know, we're gonna do a TED talk and then you're gonna write a summary about this TED talk. And it could be something inspirational. It could be from a child, you know, and then they can do these flip grids where they see themselves and they're doing their recordings and they can look. So um, the more we, uh, engage with technology and embrace technology and uh, kind of stay with the times, uh, the more our children will also be prepared for the times, right? The more we can gather ideas from them. And when we were students, learning how to type was, a you know, on a typewriter <laughs> was a class. Now they're in like third grade and they're doing dance net and they're typing. And now I don't even think they focus on typing anymore because they just assume the kids are going to pick it up and they're going to know how to type, right? So uh, just just changing with the flow and, and growing and developing and embracing it. I think for a parent perspective, if we continue to use uh, technology for our school board meetings, uh, for our PTA meetings and for our various clubs and organizations, we're going to see the increase in participation because it's a lot easier to log in and to listen in from home than it is to have to uh, be there in person, uh, go through the traffic and get there at five. And, you know, so there are some definite advantages that I'm hoping mm. that we will um, we'll mm -hmm. keep with us as we even return to school in person. Right, and it can really foster a more positive attitude towards the distance learning. Yeah. Veronica or Anna, what would, you, what would you say about the advantages of distance learning? Well, I've, I've heard from some families that they're not looking forward to the rushes in the morning to get out the door to school. So that's been a nice leisurely thing for families mm. that can take advantage of it is to 
have that. I know in our own household, my husband and I work on the weekends more than the weekdays. So for us, you know, this has been kind of an okay thing, um, but we have that luxury. So there are other advantages. Exactly what Laura just said was what I was going to bring up with the meetings. That has been so so much of a game changer. Mm. I think in Albany, they mentioned that like normal meetings, the attendance would be like, I don't know, one time I was one of three people there. Um, now they have over 600 attendees at some of the meetings. I mean, our district is really showing up and people are having conversations about the meetings outside of it. And there's a lot more parent talk and they're more informed about the decisions and the process and what's going on. That's really, really helpful because as I said in the very first comment I made, that helps us get our parents supporting our teachers, our teachers supporting our parents, and everyone working collaboratively for the students. And that's that's definitely changed before, you know, it could be like, oh, I heard this happened at a board meeting or this change was made and people can't attend. So now that's one big thing. It's not distance learning, but it's distance lifing. Mm. Um, I think for the kids, it's the easy incorporation of technology. It's also pushed some teachers mm. who were not technologically savvy mm. to become more technologically savvy mm. and that is going to be a huge benefit mm -hmm. I have my concerns as a you know alternative educator in some ways that we've got to make sure we're still getting our kids outdoors and we're still giving them time for imaginative play and that creative thought process and problem solving in the rest of real life so those are the areas I'm actually really concerned um, that when we go back in we're supporting the rest of our student um, whole child development. Uh, that's where I'm worried that we're lacking right now in the online. Cause as you said, you know, or um, as uh, someone said earlier, they don't know how tall anyone is. Well, that's true. <laughs> so we, we're missing a lot of these cues and learning those things. So making sure people are still getting that experience even you know, in small little doses. Um, the other benefits of distance learning, um, I think is that you can, more easily tailor some things to support students and their learning where there's not quite the same amount of judgment from their peers. So maybe you need to put a kid in this level of a program over here and this kid is in a level over here. Well, they're never going to know because they're doing it in their own house or their own place. So you know, I've heard and I've read some studies that yes, the mental health is, is challenging for some people right now. But there's a lot of students who are feeling less stressed. Their cortisol levels are down. They're mm -hmm. feeling more comfortable because they're in their own home for some of this, or they're in a place where they do feel supported and they're not dealing with as much of the bullying mm -hmm. and those things as they would day to day. There is still some of that going on online. And I, that's something we as educators need to be looking out for ways to navigate around. But I call this in some ways, this, the preserve the innocence here, at least for my little ones where we can kind of keep some of those inputs to the sides a little bit and give them the chance to just be kids a little more. So those are some benefits to the distance learning that I've seen so far. Mm -hmm. that, that's really important to not lose sight of that because you know those are the, you know, you can really use those uh, effectively. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with um, the, the point on parent engagement that Laura and Veronica touched upon. I think mm -hmm. at one of our school board meetings, we had over 500 people and there were, that was the Mac Zoom membership that we had gotten because we never thought we'd get over 500 people <laughs> yeah. in a early school board meeting. And then we had to stream it on Twitch and we felt very cool as a district to use a video game platform to stream our meeting. <laughs> but I think yeah, like the, the fact that, you know, I hope that some of this stays like when there's a child that has to, you know, travel abroad with their families. Well, now the teacher can is well versed in technology, as Veronica said, in you know, Google classrooms and all these apps and that child might be able to keep up with what's happening in the classroom and then come back and, you know, kind of integrate back into the classroom. I'd say that for some children that have socialization issues at school, or you know, sensory issues where that they were pragmatic speech issues that really magnify in the classroom. I think through distance learning, um, you don't have the same social issues, right? Because you're not in the classroom. However, at the same time, and I understand that that's a, that that does you know it feels better in at the short term not to have to deal with those problems, right? But in the long term, we as a district want them to be successful and to be able to have positive socialization in school. And so I feel like 
I feel very conflicted about that because on the one hand, yeah, it's okay that they're not dealing with it now, but we're not helping them, you know, deal with that challenge that they're going to have to deal with when they come back to a brick and mortar school. So I think, you know, the parent engagement, that that's the part that for me has been um, really good to see. I went to a DLAC meeting yesterday with, you know, a lot of monolingual families of mm. different languages of English language learners. And they said, this, they said, it's really easy for me to plug into these district meetings now because I can be at this meeting and also pay attention to my child. And that, you know, that's something that they said, I, I feel like I can really plug into this mm-hmm. committee. So the plugging into the committees that usually are not super well attended, mm-hmm. I think that's something that I hope that we can maintain that flexibility for parents that are super busy, but really want to plug in um, to all the different committees of the district. Mm-hmm. So there's still a lot of actually um, learning to benefit from the positives of distance learning. Um, One of our uh, members had this, well, actually, I think we all have this concern about social media, uh, speaking of uh, technology having its upsides. Um, You know, we're always uh, concerned about civics education. And of course, that's where um, this uh, virtual learning or social media has um, perhaps had um, a mixed effect. And maybe uh, you've given some thought to how um, students can be helped to um, get more out of social media so that they aren't impacted by some of the negatives, um, you know, so forth, the fake news or um, misleading, deliberately misleading information that's put out there. Um, Teaching civics education was always not that easy, uh, but now with um, these sources of um, misleading information that's very difficult to control. Um, You know, do you have some ideas about how students can be or what is important and how this is presented to students so that they aren't um, taken in or that they really get uh, a positive, have a positive experience dealing with social media? Well, we use social media as, you know, I'm wearing my Safe Roots to School hat as part of a, you know, district-wide program with SFUSD to highlight student-led projects and student-led work. And I think for the middle school and the high school, um, that can be effective, like different kinds of social media, right? Like Instagram can be effective. I've even seen like educational TikTok videos. Um, but I, but for me, I don't know how to use TikTok, but the people with older <laughs> kids probably are more well-versed than I am. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think art contests have been really effective for me in my, in my profession. We did one for walk and roll and for bike and roll. And the winners of the prizes, we were able to highlight student art and the winners of the prizes um, their art will be used for city for for bus ads, and you know there will be all over all over the city will display the student the student art. So I think that there is a creative way to use social media and to lift up the work that students are doing. Students like to see their work. Students like to lead movements. I'd say Berkeley kids in particular are very movement driven. Like you know the first one of the first meetings I had after being elected was with our youth commission <laughs> like group, and you know these students they come for you. Like you know they had a they had a a, a candidates forum that was one of the best, most like organized candidates forums by high schoolers in Berkeley that you know I had attended. And for me, um, and it, you know, it was recorded. And they, you know, they had a, a Zoom super interactive forum. And for me, I feel like using social media as a way of movement building for middle schoolers and high schoolers, I think, is really important and something that is a positive way to use social media. And it's a positive way to help students craft positive messages about their achievements. Right, like. I think students, one of the things that I wish I had learned so much 
earlier in my life than what I learned than when I learned it right is that students have such an important voice and I think Berkeley does a good job at that it's part of our DNA as a city I think you know we have there's always a protest every year for something and so my kid always participates in you know different movements in the city and I think you know using social media for movement building for student-led projects and for them to feel that that their voice is important is something that I hope we continue to build on right I've, I've done that through art competitions this year, but I, but um, and Berkeley students have done it through candidate forums. And I, I think we need to continue to build on that as a platform so they can see the, the constructive use of social media. Mm -hmm. well, definitely, yeah, definitely it can be uh, very, a very important learning tool. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the joy of uh, Google search, should I say. Now when my daughter asks me a question, I'm like, oh, just Google it, you know, you can find out. But not only Google it to find out, but then do you have another source that supports that mm. So we're able to teach them how to decipher the messages that they're getting. And is this an evidence-based opinion that you've seen, right? Mm -hmm. Like what supports it? So they're learning even earlier now how to um, gather substantial data or evidence to support mm -hmm. because they know they can't believe everything they hear right. right we used to watch tv and people would have to tell us oh you know that's tv it's fictional you know it's this is that but because they're constantly bombarded with different um opinions and different uh, images uh, you know we've come out of this totally non-fact-based president so <laughs> <laughs> they really have to learn how to decipher, you know, what is truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter who's coming from. How do you mm -hmm. form your uh, position mm -hmm. on the issue? Um, so I would say that's definitely one of the benefits of social media in this time, developing their analytical and research skills. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. We haven't begun to really explore all the possibilities for the positives of social media. Veronica. Well, Albany has, has had a bit of a history with this that was well publicized. <laughs> so it's still remembered and I feel like it is brought up somewhat often. Um, so I think this will definitely come up. I We recently watched The Social Dilemma that was a great piece done on some facets of this. I think that's a, a starting point for conversation around this and, and people's opinions for social media and its impacts on your day-to-day -day life. And also for sort of looking at that and questioning your own stance on social media and technology use. Um, we're all using it. Our kids are savvier about it than we are and they will continue to be. I always go back to remembering going through the little like index cards in the library to pull out my research book and you had to get three because you had to have research from three sources to make it um, a legitimate paper and I always go back to that of you've got to have three sources you've got to look it up different ways um, and anyone who knows you know me really well is I read a lot and I read really carefully and I'm always trying to check those resources. So I read a lot of different things about the same topic just to make sure I have a pretty good understanding and I'm really comfortable saying, I don't know, I'm not sure, let me research more. I think that's something we can teach our, our kids and our students is you don't have to have a response right away. Um, one thing about social media is it's instant. It's just there, 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 there. And they're constantly bombarded with these questioning feelings and concerns about themselves. And so giving them, again, the time and the space to sort of shut that off and, and not have that input is going to be really, really strong for our students and our children. Um, you know, that can, that can be extreme for parents to have to do, but I've heard, you know, and I, we do it in our house, our phones go in the kitchen at night they're not in our room. I think mm. giving, giving your children a strategy to navigate this and then also starting the conversation early and young about sort of the implications of, well, it's like do unto others as you would have them do unto you and sort of how your words can be taken by other people. Well, it's much easier to put those in writing or make a comment online because the response isn't a isn't a person it's just words so while that's coming into somebody constantly there's not the same processing around it so i think um also you know doing some role playing in classes and having them experience this and, and letting people feel those feelings for real of 
what social media does to you so that they can learn how to navigate away from those would be a really strong teaching method. Um, I also think showing students again, like both Laura and Anna have said, the benefits of social media and how it can be used positively. I use it every day for marketing a couple different things and it's been a learning process for me, but it's, it's really about making it something positive instead of always letting it be something negative. So yeah, it's, that's, that's going to be something all of us parents and educators really, really have to figure out and kind of come to terms with in the, in the future here. And we've got a lot more information coming at people than ever before. Absolutely. It's just really heartening to hear all these, you know, great uh, ideas from the three of you. I can imagine the board meetings are going to be uh, very interesting and very helpful going forward. Now, we have a question in the chat. Uh, that's a, a, a more of a practical nature. Um, that is, how would a return in person, a return in person instruction in the future accommodate students that don't live in the district in which they attend school? Should I repeat it? How would a return in-person instruction in the future accommodate students that don't live in the district in which they attend school? I guess, you know, the transition is, it's implied that the transition might be difficult. Um, Can I ask a clarifying question? Is this... Mm -hmm. For, for whoever asked that question, that's a, it's a very interesting thing to consider. Is this because of the health ramifications of bringing in people from outside one mm -hmm. sort of geographic area, or is this because they've been so removed for a period of time or the traveling in and out of school? I guess there's a lot of different inputs and, and both of our districts have quite a few students who attend who maybe don't live right within the district or go across an area for school. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can ask this question. Oh, here, the health issues. Hmm. Yeah, so I guess it, it is that, it's the, the health issues. Hmm. I think um, to address in-person learning uh, during COVID, we have mm -hmm. to make sure that we have strong um, testing and contact tracing uh, methods in place. That's really the only way, regardless of where you live, we need to know that we can regularly test students, that we can, um, we have the, me the method to contact trace um, is extremely important and that we're using um, the best safety practices and procedures. Um, I'm a huge fan of outdoor classrooms just because of mm -hmm. the, the mitigated risk when we're outdoors uh, and because of all of the benefits to learning that it provides for our students, especially mm -hmm. our students who like to be busy and you know can, can focus more because there's more stimulants out there with you know, the nature right there and mm -hmm. the creativity that um, learning outdoors can bring to our curriculum. So I think uh, that is definitely the way to go, especially as we look at spring and as we look at robust yeah. summer programming that we really need to be uh, well aware of, of course, having all our PPE in place, but really making sure that we have our testing and our contact tracing methods down and that we are, um, constantly repeating to people the um, the safety procedures, right? Because the longer you're around people, the easier it is to get laxy daisy about, you know, your mask being on or did you wash your hands? So just being constant about reminding people, you know, what you do on the weekends is going to impact your ability to come back here on Monday, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you were doing X, Y, or Z, you went outside of the area, you know, you, you've somehow increase your exposure risk, then you, we really need you to think twice before you just come here on Monday to back to school. So that kind of education is going to be very important in getting those kinds of communal agreements um, coupled with the testing and the contact tracing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
any other thoughts? So um, actually here's a related, uh, now that FDA has given the Pfizer vaccine emergency authorization, um, is there a plan in place to vaccinate student population? Well, my understanding is that hasn't been tested for those under 16. And that's mm. just my understanding from the news. So I'm not an expert in any way. <laughs> um, so I'm not quite sure how fast, you know, students or any or children will be able to get the vaccination. But I do know that as a, a school board association that they we are advocating to make sure that educators uh, can be, uh, you know, bumped mm. up on the list mm -hmm. so that they can receive the vaccinations uh, sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Anna may know more, of course, this is her wheelhouse. Well, the, the only thing, and I think you, you summarized it really well, Laura, the only other thing that I heard is that we are looking into student testing. That's not a requirement for coming back into school, but I know that um, we are trying to go above and beyond and really look into student testing in Berkeley. Great. And even on. after the vaccine, begins to, um, comes on, uh, you know, with, we're urged to still be uh, cautious and still practice um, good uh, hygiene and all of the other you know, masking and so forth. When the situation warrants it, we can't um, just assume that vaccine introduction is going to take care of everything. Yeah, so in a way, again, you know, there are good sides to even bad situations where um, becoming aware of what's involved here, the biology of the situation and so forth um, has, could have very um, good, um, effects in the long run yeah yeah mask wearing will never be taboo again like, right <laughs> right <totally acceptable. laughs> well said <laughs> they, they are saying that our flu rates are way way down this year so it's ah, it's yeah. impressive to see what we've been able to do by mask wearing social distancing and getting flu right. shots is we can, we can do this with the technology. I also will say on the testing front and bringing students in from other um, areas, you know, I've, I've been really surprised by the challenges with testing that we continue to face. And I, I get periodically tested just because I'm with a small cohort of kids and we work as essential workers still. And I feel that that's my responsibility is to be periodically tested. That is difficult to do because there are timing delays. There's a huge demand and it's not as as foolproof as, as one would hope so i'm i'm surprised that at this point we're still sort of battling to get that basic thing fixed up and at a good point for all of us to be able to have that to rely on i think once that becomes more solidified going back to school will feel more comfortable but right now i just had conversations with a handful of people who were like, oh i've never been tested before oh what is it like and i was thinking, oh, we're nine months into the pandemic here. And uh, mm. there are a lot of us who who have done that consistently. And there are still some people who haven't done it for whatever reasons, maybe they didn't need to, or they haven't had interactions. Um, and then, you know, the fact that we're getting the contact tracing app here in California, and I hope more people take advantage of that and log in so that we can look into it uh, and, and know if we've had a potential contact, we can be more careful and more safe. And again, the more we just keep things outdoors right now, we, we still just kind of have that in our back pocket. And I think utilizing the summer for all of these things will really be to our benefit. You know, in California, we're so lucky, our weather's great. And we do have the fire season and it is cold out right now. So we may have to get a little creative in this upcoming year and think outside the box. So I, I hope that our districts will look at that to say we wanna deliver as much as we can to the students when we can, but also understanding that that may look different than traditional years. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's had 
its definite um, benefits to making us more aware and more uh, deepened our understanding of all of these phenomena, public health, uh, you know, even biology of viruses and so forth. So, yeah, always look on the bright side while you're, you know, taking precautions for the bad side. <laughs> So I think we've reached our limit. Um, I don't see any other, uh, okay. There's, there is a question here, worried about the lack of physical interactions among students. I think that's been touched on. Uh, people are um, aware of that, um, the need to provide, um, physical interaction. Um, but I, this has really been uh, a great discussion. I'm so glad that uh, you have come to give us the benefit of your insights and experience. And I know that your school districts are going to also benefit from your knowledge, your energy, uh, you know, what you have to offer. Uh, yeah, it's very impressive. And um, again, congratulations to all three of you. Um, we're looking forward to hearing more of your wisdom in the future.